With its origins in England in the early 19th century, industrial capitalism transformed the economies of Northern Europe and then the United States, tightly knitting together first a North Atlantic and then a global economy. Profits derived from commercial capitalism earlier in the century provided the basis for industrial capitalism. Industrial capitalism, the private investment of massive amounts of money in machinery, technology, and massive and complex factories and processing plants, represented a striking new phase of economic development that required new organizational models. The U.S. entered this new phase of economic development later than many European nations. But by 1900, the U.S. emerged as the world's industrial leader. The new industrial order spun webs across the continent, across the Atlantic, and around the world over which money, technology, people, and goods flowed. American products, from Heinz Pickles to Singer sewing machines, became household names around the world. Big business, as Americans referred to these new enterprises, generated unprecedented wealth for those who emerged victorious in the fierce competition that marked the era. Industry also produced more and cheaper consumer goods, available to more people in more places than ever before in history. But at the same time, big business spawned fears among many Americans. The unchecked power of industrialists, largely unfettered by regulatory laws, frightened them as they ruthlessly crushed competition, created monopolies, and wielded excessive influence over government. Many Americans believe that extreme concentrations of wealth in the hands of a few seem to create an aristocracy in the democratic U.S., Technological innovations powered by fossil fuels made the new industrial order, industrial capitalism, possible in both the U.S. and Northern Europe. Coal-fueled steam engines and machines that were both bigger and faster than those in the first industrial revolution. It energized electricity grids that powered manufacturing as well as the railroads that carried these products to new markets. Coal also provided a crucial ingredient for one of the most important new products of this era, steel. Like those in Northern Europe, nearly all of the manufacturing regions of the U.S. sat atop or near rich coal deposits. Innovative technologies spawned new manufacturing processes and products. Complex technical industries such as steel, chemicals, Petroleum, electrical products, and pharmaceuticals developed new production techniques. Huge factories running around the clock allowed manufacturers to produce larger volumes of their products at a lower cost, known as economies of scale. Not only could novel and larger amounts of products be manufactured in more places, these goods also could reach new markets due to the network of railroads that laced the nation. Pioneered by the railroads, the modern corporation differed from corporations established earlier in the century in regards to size, scale, and organization. To finance the massive job of building a railroad, railroad corporations sold shares to investors. Modern corporations also required new forms of management. Railroads found themselves faced with the vast challenge of administering and coordinating a complex, technologically advanced enterprise involving the movement of cars over hundreds of miles. A board of directors who represented stockholders provided joint general control of the company. A layer of managers with specialized skills oversaw daily operations. Railroads organized departments with clear lines of authority and communication, manned with specialists in engineering, scheduling, and finance, just to name a few, which all together created an elaborate bureaucracy. These new corporations benefited significantly from the limited legal liability of their owners, the shareholders. Legally independent from the people who created it, the corporation, should it go bankrupt, bore no liability beyond the money invested by its stockholders who couldn't lose more than they invested, 
This legal benefit promoted economic ventures as it reduced the risk to investors. Big business generated wealth on an unprecedented scale. In 1860, approximately 300 Americans were millionaires. Roughly 40 years later, that number had risen to around 4,500, with many multimillionaires. In the 1870s, the richest Americans were railroad men, such as Cornelius Vanderbilt, who topped the list with an estimated wealth of $100 million. By 1896, oil man John D. Rockefeller and steel king Andrew Carnegie were the richest Americans, amassing fortunes of between $200 to $300 million. Measuring wealth as a percentage of the economy, Rockefeller remains to this day the richest individual in American history, outstripping even contemporary business entrepreneurs, such as Microsoft's Bill Gates. The new industrial order was well underway in Europe by the time the American economy began its transition during the Civil War. In 1870, Great Britain was the world's premier industrial power, followed by Germany. But by 1900, the U.S. emerged as the globe's leading industrial nation. By that point, the nation produced more than 30% of the world's manufacturing output. A number of factors account for this rise. The U.S. was blessed with an abundance of natural resources. Cotton from the southern states, coal from Pennsylvania, and iron ore from Minnesota provided the raw materials necessary for rapid industrial growth. The U.S. also greatly benefited from Great Britain's industrial head start as British investors poured their surplus wealth into the U.S., providing a large percentage of the money needed to help capitalize large-scale industry, particularly railroads. The nation's dramatic population growth through both natural increase and immigration also greatly aided industrial development. As the nation exploded from 31 million people in 1860 to 76 million by 1900, this population supplied labor for rapidly expanding industries, as well as a healthy market of consumers to purchase the many goods mass-produced by American industry. Vertical integration also fueled industrialization, as it cut costs and guaranteed a regular flow of raw materials for production. Carnegie Steel, for example, owned, in addition to its massive steel mills, the mines that produced the raw materials needed for steel production, such as coal, coke, and iron ore, as well as the railroads and steamships to transport raw materials to steel mills. Carnegie also set up sales offices to distribute steel efficiently and thus controlled both the production and distribution process. Horizontal integration aimed to tame the destructive elements of vigorous competition. The early oil industry, for example, was especially competitive and unstable as oilmen engaged in cutthroat competition. Rockefeller and Standard Oil were notorious for eliminating competitors through secret deals with railroads that penalized rival oil companies in outright intimidation. To guarantee profits, oilmen first created cartels in which they agreed informally to fix prices and set quotas for production, and thus to share massive profits. But these informal agreements often broke down, and the American public vigorously protested price fixing. Seeking a way to centralize control through consolidation, Rockefeller devised the trust. Stockholders and individual oil corporations turned their stock over to a small group of trustees, including Rockefeller himself, who ran the various parts of Standard Oil as one company. In return, the stockholders received profits from the combination, but had no direct control over the decisions of the trustees. Standard Oil soon had a monopoly of the industry as a single company that controlled more than 90% of oil refining in the U.S. by the 1880s. By 1904, the company's profits reached $57 million. The first and most notorious trust, 
Standard Oil served as a model as trusts in beef, tobacco, and sugar soon followed. Although the trust was a specific type of business organization, to the American public, the term trust became synonymous with any large business combination. To men like Rockefeller, the trust represented the pinnacle of modern business enterprise. But to average Americans, it meant the demise of small, independent businesses that could no longer compete, and higher prices for consumers. Many people also feared that trust placed far too much power in the hands of a few individuals who would inevitably abuse that power. Concentrations of wealth in the Gilded Age reflected the growth of combinations, trusts, and monopolies. A study in 1890 concluded that more than half of the nation's wealth was in the hands of just 17% of America's families, down from 29% in 1860. In the late 1880s, an American economist warned that by his calculations, the U.S. suffered greater inequity than England. The U.S., he argued, had developed its own aristocracy. Public outcry over concentrations of wealth, combinations, and monopolies forced Congress to pass the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890. Henry Demarest Lloyd's 1881 investigation of Standard Oil, the story of a great monopoly, spawned subsequent articles in the popular press that fanned the flames of public outrage. Federal and state government provided little regulation for the burgeoning new economic order. Laissez-faire, otherwise known as hands-off economics, was gospel to businessmen and the politicians they supported. This economic doctrine insisted that government not interfere with business or the market. And though they often engaged in price-fixing, industrialists argued that businesses should compete, quote, naturally, and unimpeded by government regulation. As a result, they argued, society as a whole would benefit. Despite their devotion to theories about non-regulation and the self-made man, American businessmen greatly benefited from governmental aid. Federal support for railroads, protective tariff legislation, a favorable legal climate, and the intervention of state and federal authorities to crush labor movements all fostered the nation's exceptional business growth and unprecedented profits for businessmen and politicians. Cheap, reliable transportation, swift communication systems, and technological advances made national and international markets possible, fueling the industrial growth of the U.S., with the nation's extensive railway system, manufactured goods could now be shipped to previously isolated parts of the country. The telegraph, and later the telephone, made it possible to coordinate shipments through instant communication. Inventions such as the refrigerated railroad car, pioneered by Gustavus Swift, made it possible to ship dressed beef from Chicago's stockyards to eastern cities and across the Atlantic. Mass production spawned a revolution in consumer items. The American public and the world had access to a flood of cheap goods, affordable items that were unthinkable just years before. In 1894, for example, the Bureau of Labor noted that, compared to the era of hand production, America's factories produced 20 times more watches and 10 times as many overalls per week. Mail-order catalogs provide one indication of the consumer items available to average Americans in this era. In 1872, Aaron Montgomery Ward founded the nation's first mail-order house, as railroads opened up new markets in rural America, and factories produced cheap goods in massive quantities. His catalogs featured tens of thousands of items, including farm equipment, Singer sewing machines, straight-edged razors, and gospel hymn books. Sears, Roebuck, and Company soon competed with Ward for the rural market, labeling its catalog the Farmer's Friend. 
By 1900, Sears processed 10,000 orders a day in its Chicago headquarters. While offering a universe of goods to rural and small-town Americans, the mail-order firms deeply damaged the sales of small-town merchants who fought back against these big businesses by sponsoring bonfires of mail-order catalogs. To country merchants, Ward and Sears represented the evils of big business. But to their customers, the mail-order houses offered a huge assortment of affordable goods previously unavailable to them. After successfully integrating and exploiting the national market, American firms marketed their goods abroad. Long before creating a political empire, Americans built a global commercial empire. American businesses competed successfully with their chief industrial rival, Great Britain. A plethora of products, from Singer sewing machines to McCormick farm equipment to Heinz pickles, became household names all over the world. American companies followed the general pattern established by Singer, first selling their products abroad through international sales and distribution systems, and then establishing factories abroad from Europe to Asia, where they could take advantage of raw materials and cheap labor. By the late 19th century, many American companies developed into full-fledged multinational corporations, including Kodak and Heinz. American companies often presented international marketing not as a means to profits, but as a benevolent, noble act as they provided the gifts of their superior culture to an uncivilized world.